I wonder how much someone would pay now to be given a business that's struggling and say you've got three years just to learn and see what happens. Mm. Way more valuable than uni these days, I would have thought. It is. And I think people obviously hear that concept more now, but I still don't think most people would take that option. True. <laughs> it's probably not good for your mm. mental health as well, just to <laughs> jump into that. Okay, so we've touched on, we've skirted around a bit that you've you've got this, uh, this workwear business. You obviously learned a lot. And then you went on to the next business. So I did about three years three years in the workwear business. We went from kind of three hundred thousand pound loss to thirty thousand pound profit. But the next business and the lessons that you took then became the most successful strip club chain in the UK. It did. Now, wild. There the, 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 the was a, there was a little not so much a stepping stone, but I didn't go from workwear to strip clubs. I went from the workwear business to to leisure in general. Yes. So I, I wanted to. I knew I wanted to be in leisure. I didn't know I wanted to be in strip clubs. I just yeah. wanted to be in, wanted to be in bars and clubs. So I opened a bar in the city centre and also a, a couple of a couple of pubs on the outskirts, which performed so so. But what I what I realised I was missing from those, and, and just going back to the cash flow lesson, I mean, I I bought those units by learning to meddle with the cash flow as well. And I, a, mm. a friend a friend of mine at the time taught me even more extended cash flow games. Really, where I mean, this is back in the days of checks. Nice, okay. <laughs> and and uh, and and what we did with it, one of these pubs I bought, I, I forget the exact figures, but basically I was go- I was going to be able to buy this. Uh, this pub for the price of the stock that was in there. They were just effectively going to wow. hand the lease over. And and we timed it. So we went in on a Friday night, completed the purchase on a Friday, paid for the stock by check, which wasn't going to clear until until the following Wednesday, and then traded traded the arse off that pub over, over, over the weekend to make, to make sure that we'd sold the stock in time for Wednesday for the check to clear, and then, bu- and then bought another week's stock on credit and you know, if, wow. if, if, if kept, ca- carried on and carried on. Managed to work, make it work for that, but these pubs were and the bar in town. They were never going to you know, pull up any trees. Uh, and what I realised that they were missing was different streams of income with high margin, other than just selling the beer, selling beer alone. Uh, you know, so all the, the well, the three units I had, we just sold alcohol. You know, on a on a modest margin, you know, sixty five percent type margin. Mm. When I looked at the really successful venues, they had other income streams so it could have been selling food it could have been uh, money from the door uh, you know it could have been ent- entertainment like djs and things you know r- r- reasons why you could charge more money mm. and and get higher margin and I'd been spending a lot of my free time in the local strip club, um, which uh, I and I got to know the manager, got to know the staff and the girls, and understood how their business model worked. And realised that the uh, the economics of the strip club business was exactly what my what my business was missing, um, with um, you know three different streams of income, two of which were 100% margin. The third one, which was the alcohol, was much better margin than I'd be getting because it was effectively a captive market. Sure, you know, yeah. if you've got a pub you know and the price of a, a local pint whatever two pound ten two pound twenty back in those days then that's the price you know if, if you're selling it for 210 i can't go and sell it for three and a half quid if i'm selling that same beer in a strip club yeah you, you, you don't care what the price of the beer is i could sell you the same thing for five quid mm. and and, and you and you pay it so i realized it, these were the economics of the business that i needed uh and i poached the poached the manager who was working there to ask him to come and be my uh, effectively my, my right hand man um and we went we found a, a a unit in wakefield couldn't find one in leeds i wanted to be in leeds but found one in wakefield opened that in march 2004 mm-hmm. it was march 2004 uh, and that was that was the first one and that was i guess in terms of everything i done up until that point in business that was the first thing that was that was really successful everything else was I got paid it was a learning it was a learning curve you know I earned a earned a wage that I could have probably earned anywhere else so I could have probably earned more more somewhere else but that, that was the first thing that, that really that took off that hit the ground running what that's incredible and so what age were you when you opened that first one? 23 so 23. So how did you get the cash flow to work? Because that seems like a big part of your story. You're really good at, at organising the funds to get to that first place to be open. So don't hold me to the exact numbers, but sure. rough, rough, rough terms. The the there was a the venue in Wakefield was about three hundred and sixty five grand I think it was to buy to buy this venue it was a freehold I mean it shows how long wow, this was yeah. you know? and it was big it was a big lump like ten thousand square feet or something, um, and I went to see 
a bank manager in Wakefield at the local HSBC, which was literally, I can remember it like yesterday, like 50 yards around the corner. There was a, a, a bank manager, there, Andrew Bennett. Nice. And he, and this is back in the days when these banks had some local discretion to be able to be able to make their own decisions. And this guy, Andrew, ran the local unit. He was able to sign off a loan of up to a million quid. And um, he agreed that he would fund the purchase of the um, of the bar for me. So they were going to give you know seventy percent of the three hundred and sixty five grand. I had to put the change in, um, and then when I'd fitted it out, if it was worth more than it was when I bought it, they would then refinance it for me again on a, on, a, on another seventy percent. And we projected that by the time it was fitted out, it was probably going to be worth a million quid. So he'd lend about seven hundred grand at that point. So rough numbers were it was going to be three hundred sixty five grand to buy it, about three hundred grand to fit it out. So I'd be in for kind of you know six sixty five ish. If I if it was then worth a million and I could get the seventy percent loan to value, I'd be able to get all my money back out and I'd be okay. I had, but I needed a hundred. I needed about a hundred grand to put into it, and I needed the three hundred grand for the builders. I had the hundred grand, give or take. Well, I had about, I had about 130, 140 grand at this point because I'd, I'd as well as uh, the the business I'd worked in, I had uh, bought two or three properties, uh, just some student properties in 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 Headingley back in Leeds, which I bought in about nineteen ninety eight and sold in about two thousand and two, and they and they got up and I'd sold them, so I, I kind of cashed out everything I had and you know, the money from the pubs and stuff. So I had my hundred odd grand to put down on the um, on the purchase of the building, and I had the money Money for the first week to pay to pay the contractors of the um, of the bar. So buy the building, pay the contractors the first week's money, and they start doing the job. But that's that's me completely out of money. Um, so you know, week two comes along. These build these builders come asking for asking for the second week's payment. You know, this is the second week of about twelve weeks or whatever it was. And I thought if I tell them now, they're going to cut the losses. But if I can blag them for a few weeks and get them so deep in, I've got a fighting chance of making them see it through. So I kind of made an excuse for week two, excuse for week three. And by the time the four weeks in, I sit down with these guys and have to say, listen, I've got to fess up. I, um, I've, I, haven't, I haven't got the money to finish this job off. Uh, obviously, they weren't too happy about it. But I said, listen, we've got two choices here. I said, you can beat me up, string me up, do what you want but you're not going to get paid or you can see this job through. I've showed that I showed them the offer of finance with the bank. I said, the bank will finance this at the end, but I just need to get to the end. I said, to get me to the end, charge me some penalties, you know, mm. do, you know, do, do, do whatever you want, put you, put yourself an extra drink on there, but let's get to the end and you'll, you'll get out of this with all your money and more. I'll get the venue open. I'm sure we'll all be friends again by then. And you might even be able to do unit number two with me, unit number three with me. Uh, and ultimately that's what we did after a lot of, a uh, lot of shouting and argy bargy. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they, they agreed to, they agreed to see the job through, got to the end Andrew Bennett and his HSBC branch were good to the word. They refinanced the unit, uh, paid off the builders, and um, and the rest is history. I think that what's really cool there, I think, is that you're you're so young to have that financial literacy, but also the confidence and the foresight to do all that stuff. Where did that appetite for risk come from? Do you think? Or do you not see it as risk at the time? Maybe. I mean, listen, it's it's risk, but I guess I see it probably as I didn't really have a choice okay. because ultimately, I had, well, I mean, everyone's going to have their own view on risk and their own view on morality yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm sure, you know, some people will look at that as a lovely creative story and some will say, Matt's a total crook, <laughs> <Matt's> a total <laughs> crook who, tried to, who tried to spank some builders. Um, but I guess the way I saw it was um, I would happily risk the lot because – the 120, 130 grand that I had to my name was was neither here nor there. It, it wasn't the millions that I wanted, um, and I would rather go all in and try and try and try and you know double it, triple it, quadruple it, and risk losing it because if I lost it, uh, it wouldn't be too complicated for me to go and make it again. Mm. So I think that's probably that's probably where I mean my appetite for risk has always really been based around the fact that I know I can make it back again. Yeah, so you and exactly because that comes back down to confidence and financial literacy, right? You understood, I can do this if you help me do that. You're just looking at solving the problem again. Simple problem solving. If you like these episodes, feel free to subscribe to our Healthy Hustle newsletter below, where you'll get behind the scenes information from our guests, as well as from the studio operator who helps us create these cinematic episodes. 
It's also full of business advice and tips, and it will help you join the community of healthy entrepreneurs.